We have candelas. We have a lot of other things that we, uh, seven basic standards, but uh, those are the three that I'm responsible for. I should also point out that you may also be able to uh, uh, look with a little bit of superiority not too long to your mechanical friends. The only artifact which is still a hunk of metal is the kilogram. Uh, so there is a, in Paris and in Washington, D.C., and in a number of capitals around the world, hunks of metal, which are the kilogram. Well, it turns out the we have taken our electrical quantities using the Josephson junction and the quantum Hall effect uh, with exquisite precision. The, uh, we can compare two Josephson junctions to a couple of parts in 10 to the 17th, which it, it, it's amazing that God made them that good. Uh, there they really are uh, exquisitely uh, precise instruments. Then we can use the ampere balance to monitor the kilogram. So we've suddenly made kilograms an electrical measurement. And we hope to be able to announce that within the next few years. Around the world, the kilogram will become an electrical measurement. Um, so those are the kind of standards that we do work on. The second kind of standards, the word standard is also used for the paper standards. How do we, we all get together and decide we're going to measure something in the same way. Now that, in the United States, that process is maintained by the private sector. Uh, IEEE works on that, uh, ANSI works on that, ASTM works on that. The role of NIST is to take the measurements that we have developed and offer it to industry in that form so that all of our professional staff, I think on the average we, we calculate something like we have three uh, standards committee memberships for each professional staff member. That's one of the ways we get our information out. The only kind of paper standards that we write ourselves have to do with certain <coughs> limited sets of Procure, government procurement standards for computers. But other than that, we don't write paper standards. That's done uh, in this country uh, in the uh, exquisite uh, confusion and uh, robustness of the marketplace. It's not done by the government. Okay. Want me to answer me a couple yeah, more? Yeah, one more on the international. I have two. Yeah, I have two more. Go ahead and finish them. Okay. Uh, I, these have to do with international. They're looking at two sides of the same coin. Uh, one is concerning the transfer of uh, uh, R&D technology, and they want to know, uh, with the multinational companies, how do we keep developments in the U.S. Uh, for U.S. companies? The, uh, the second question is, are the partnerships you described open to non-U.S. companies? Uh, and I think that we're... I've, my talk, the basis of my talk was changes. I could give another full talk on the changes of uh, uh, globalization of the economy. But there are a couple of fixed points, that we're, a couple of things that uh, I can say here quickly. Number one is we're learning that it makes no sense to try to put up barriers. Barriers don't work. As I said in my, uh, my talk, what we have to do is be smarter, be stronger, and run faster. So that we've got to get the new technology into our uh, companies, and they've got to uh, be the center pole on the tent. As you raise the tent, you, you can't raise just your own economy. All the economies have to come up, but if you want to be competitive, you want to get there a little first and be a little higher as you're raising that tent. So we've got to focus on uh, developing the technologies and using them uh, quickly and being agile in doing that. Uh, now, each country, each developing and developed country in the world has different mechanisms for how the indigenous industry works with their local government. Uh, and the various governments have various ways they work together, and a number of the companies are working together, uh, with, with, are working with all of the uh, uh, various governments of the areas in which they work. Uh, we're setting up regional areas, the European common market, the North American equivalent of the common market. Uh, this whole process is changing. The situation right now is generally companies are working most closely uh, with the uh, governments in which they're doing their manufacturing. And uh, the, uh, the, the government R&D efforts in all the developed countries are cooperating and collaborating and being consistent. And this is an evolving situation. And the, so the quick answer to the question is, are partnerships open uh, to non-U.S. companies? With the U.S. government, generally there are large impediments to that. But there are these kind of, of, uh, of linkages that are being established between governments and industries everywhere. My final question I can give a short answer to. That says, how does the, an individual use the National Technology Transfer Center to gain assistance with a cooperative research and development, uh, cooperative, pray this, this is research and development agreement. I know I could do it. With a cooperative research and development agreement. Somebody wrote me initials and I didn't have names. Uh, my, my answer to that is probably you don't want to. The National Technology Transfer Center is a clearinghouse to help bring people together. 
But if you really want an effective cooperative research and development agreement, uh, you need to work with the people with whom you're cooperating. So make the contact with the laboratory, with the people that you're uh, talking to, and talk to them directly, I think is a better way of doing it. They, that's not to denigrate the Technology Transfer Center. It does a wonderful job of opening those doors. But to then come to closure on an agreement, uh, that's generally done between the organization or individual who wants to do it and the uh, uh, government laboratory that's doing the work. And those are all my questions. Thank you. I think we have uh, another one or two for you, Eleanor. Boy, this is a group interested in education. I'm delighted. Oh, do you want me to do this one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, new graduates are extremely adept in manipulating software, but are unable to explain or lack a basic understanding of the results. And that's from Dave Russo in Seattle. You're just recruiting from the wrong schools, Dave. <laughs> Seriously, um, that's the point. The point is back to basics. We worry too much about giving these kids the latest advanced concepts we think they're going to need, experience with the very latest in program. We've really got to go back to basics and get them to. Kids who really understand the fundamentals of engineering are going to be good engineers all of their lives and can build on that fundamental background. That's exactly what I'd like to do and see. I can, uh, having been through this program a long time ago, I can vouch for the fundamentals I learned li stayed with me for 50 years. And Bill Brownlee sitting there, I'm sure, would echo the same words. Uh, another question, I'll paraphrase it. Uh, the public is very concerned about technological risks, nuclear, EHV, et cetera. Uh, field problems, uh, what are the universities doing to educate future policymakers about the risks inherent in these technologies versus the risks of not having these technologies? I think the real answer is they're doing very little. And that was the point I was trying to make with engineering schools taking the leadership in at least talking about how technical decisions are made, what it is that engineers do, how engineers look at program, uh, I'm sorry, look at problems. Not only do not do liberal arts graduates not have any background of this sort at all, but very few people in business schools work with engineers to get this kind of background as well. It's a serious lack. And I don't think these other schools are going to come running to engineering schools and say, please help us. I think it's for us to reach out to these other individuals and really fill in what's an enormous void in the education of our citizenry. Uh, Does that you have a, want a comment? I just sure. want to uh, make, return to, to my previous question. Uh, if any people are interested in access to uh, our massively parallel computers, uh, I will be available to say how to get in touch with me afterwards. So come up and talk to me. Uh, we have a few more questions. Maybe we'll give uh, everyone a chance to ask questions to the floor. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? If so, raise your hand. We have one there. Yes, sir. Would you give us your name, uh, gentleman with the beard? Would you give us your name and affiliation and ask your question to whoever you want? Oh, can everyone hear? No. no. Why don't you come up here then? We don't have any microphones out in the audience. Right Use the podium. And could you repeat about being fascinated by what I said? <laughs> My name is John Newbury. I'm from the Open University Faculty of Technology in the United Kingdom. Um, I don't know where to start, so perhaps I'll use in engineering terms a top-down approach. The question was asked, should universities undertake uh, research? Of course they should. Um, there's no doubt about that because it has a direct feedback into their own graduate scores, their undergraduate scores. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to make a few observations. I don't know whether there's any by I know there's a few colleagues from the United Kingdom here who work in universities like myself. Um, the problem is that in the United Kingdom, 
and I suppose this applies to American universities, you're probably judged on your research record. Yes. In the United Kingdom, there is now a uh, measure of the quality of research. And this takes part um, every three to four years. And if you get a good research rating, and that goes from one to five, one, on a grade one to five, one, well, you shouldn't have started doing research, and five, you've got an international reputation. If you get a five or something like that or four, then you attract a lot of money. And from us, it's from our Science and Engineering Research Council, and also you get well known by industry. The problem is that it has a dramatic knock on effect in so far that many staff are being driven to do research because that will draw in more money and that will therefore help in the finances of the university in that particular engineering department. In some departments such as engineering, this is very easy. In arts, it's probably a, a bit more difficult. And the point is that when you have a lot of staff driving in to do research, then perhaps even graduate students do suffer because they don't get the supervision. And then it passes down to undergraduates who don't get a lot of help. And this is, I see this in some universities, whereby you have 100, 150 attending lectures. These aren't the high caliber students that we all like to have. And this has ramifications for the students because they're left on their own to study. And some of these students come into the, into the schools because they haven't been taught the right maths and physics. And so that cuts down on the basic fundamentals. Um, where, does that, where does that leave us? Well, basically, there has to be a greater tie-up between what we call our secondary schools, our sixth form schools, your colleges, to teach the basic physics and mathematics. Because this is having ramifications in the British university system. If you go to Cambridge University now to do a degree in physics, it's four years. And people are going in there with the top grades in maths and physics and chemistry. But because there is so much to teach, they've had to extend their degrees to four years. And there's others, such as the Imperial College of Science and Technology, considering doing that. When I talk to industry, they say, in the university degrees in engineering in the UK, in the last year, our students were allowed to specialize in many subjects. And they say, this is good. If you're going to get someone specialized in communications engineering or signal processing, um, if they're going to work in that area and that company takes on, that's fine. But basically, what we would like to see is students who have good fundamental engineering um, basis in their degree. And that, that means that they can solve analytical problems. They've got a good background in mathematics. They've got a good background in physics. I'm a physicist, a nuclear astrophysicist. And my physics has carried me around to work in what I work in now in power line carrier communications. So you need to know basic physics, basic mathematics, good computing skills. Every engineering and science student needs that. Basic analog and digital skills. Um, basic communication skills. Um, I, could, I could go on. But it is a severe problem that these days, compared with 25 years ago, there is far more to teach our students. And it's what you have to give up. And the problem is that some of the basic skills that should be taught in the first years aren't being taught. I could go on. Thank you very much. And I do use Ethernet and Internet. I live by it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments. And I, I'd like to just comment on two things that, that you talked about. The first of those is the difference in educational systems in other countries. I was one of the people who was very privileged to spend some time visiting universities in the former Soviet republics and was very struck there, not only by the variety of programs and what there they consider an engineer, like railroad engineering will have a whole school, for example, and that's not a field that in this country we really want to spend much time and effort em emphasizing. But the philosophy there is a very close tie-in between the university and a particular industry. So the aim is to teach an engineer to go into a particular industry and a very particular job in that industry. Our philosophy is very different because we don't channel students to a particular job in a particular company with really, at that time, there was just no choice for them at all. 
The other comment that you made is fundamental, I think, in everything I've been talking about, and that's nothing's going to change if we don't do something very serious about the faculty reward system. The faculty reward system is so much slanted towards research that it really discourages faculty from developing new courses, developing laboratories, and from really mentoring students. There isn't a school in the country that will say anything different from in order to get rewards, in order to get promotion, in order to get tenure, it's based on teaching, on research, and on service to the school. But it's how it's weighted and how we can measure things that varies very, very much, and we've got to really work on that within the universities. Yes, There's about. one thing I want to say for balance, because it plays off my talk, though, sure. is that uh, uh, I understand what's being said about worrying about overweighting the basic research, but I think what we've got to be very careful about is we have found a successful way of That's making right. sure the universities do this very well. Yes. Let's not make everything mediocre. Let's Absolutely. move the rest of it up to that level. So. Absolutely, because the graduate education in this country has absolutely been the best in the world, and we want to make sure it stays that way. You know, I could just comment on that also. There are, there are countries in the world in which, in which uh, basic scientific research is done outside the university. Mm -hmm. And research exists in the academy, and the universities exist to do teaching. And by and large, that system has not worked. The, right. the level of the, of the research and of the teaching is inferior to that which we get in this country. And many such countries, including those states of the former Soviet Union and uh, mm -hmm. uh, from Eastern Europe, are struggling with transforming their teaching and research institutions to be more like the U.S. model. We have a Mr. David Jackson who would like to make a brief comment. Would you give your affiliation, please, Mr. Jackson? Yes, David Jackson, R.W. Beck and Associates. My affiliation with IEEE is with Power Engineering Society and Industry Application Society. I serve on the IEEE Fellows Committee. In regard to the faculty rewards, I would point out engineer rewards. One of the problems I see in serving in two years on the Fellows Committee is most of the applications, or I should say the um, nominations for Fellow, come in uh, indicating tremendous contributions in research. We get but the fellow nomination is open to people who have excelled in management and development of, and in manufacturing and in many other fields. And if you want to change the culture, we need to get more people in manufacturing and industry to nominate outstanding people in those fields so that they can become fellows and so that we don't get so many and a predominance of people nominated from academia and research. And if you people out in the audience and in IEEE can get more nominations of the other kinds of engineering performance, then we can begin to change the culture in the fellows committee and in the people who are looked up to in our society. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a a uh, question here, which I'm going to try and tackle. It was addressed to Dr. Baum, but uh, uh, this is unsigned, but it says the, that this panel today has elucidated the need for engineering talent and leadership. And he says that, uh, or she says, that the uh, CEOs mouth these words, but the organizations they uh, head are structured to prevent the rise or development of versatile leaders who are engineers. And the reason they do this, because these people feel the uh, rise of engineering threatens their current position of engineering power. This is a very serious statement. I, I think whoever wrote this needs to sit back and, and don't curse the darkness. This may be true in some areas. What you need to do is use the considerable intellect that you have as an engineer to see how to solve this problem. Uh, what can you do to help show these people that engineers really can provide this leadership role? Obviously, they're skeptical, but I believe most businesses are run by people, are run by boards, who are looking for people 
who can run their businesses well. Capitalism, the profit incentive, ensures this. Admittedly, there are people in power who will do things to try to keep their position of power. But think through the problem, see how to solve it. And if you get to the point where you believe it's unresolvable, change your job. Don't stay there and be unhappy, as someone would indicate in this, this information here. I think that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, you need to do. Uh, and engineers have the minds with which to analyze these problems. Well, we're, we're getting near the end of our session. As, are there any other questions that we need to answer? Well, uh, this is my last session here as chairman of the Power Engineering Society, and I've enjoyed it and done it for about three years. And I just thought I'd take this opportunity. About half of you are gone, but I'll, the half were here, you're going to have to listen to a very brief closing sermon. I was listening to our president last Tuesday night in his speech calling for a renewal of our country. And I'd like to say to all, I, I know that the engineers in this country stand ready to do their part. But our government must give us a chance. In the USA, we have an attorney general. We have a surgeon general. We have a ac general accounting office. Do we have an engineering general? Do we have a general engineering office? The president of the United States and vice president regularly make points of speaking to doctors at AMA conversions. Uh, conventions, to lawyers at American Bar Association meetings. They host regular dinners frequently for people from the entertainment industry, opera singers, dancers, Michael Jackson, etc. Their publicity releases often claim their intent to work closely with the engineering profession to use our capabilities in solving national problems. And this is true in other countries, not just the United States. Their actions, however, particularly their appointments to key government positions, do not fulfill these claims. About 90% of the top appointments go to lawyers, even in highly technical areas. Why don't engineers speak out more about government policy? I've talked at length to some of my friends in Belgium and France about this, where the same problem is. And they point out that engineers are often limited by restrictions placed on them by their employers. Engineers are bound, if you take a job somewhere, to conform with the policies of that organization. And since engineers work for large organizations, large companies most of the time, they are bound to conform with the policies of these large companies. Or again, you, you don't work there, or shouldn't work there. The uh, lawyers, doctors, and other people tend to be smaller practitioners. They're much freer to express their views. As a result, uh, and this is a term that somebody in France coined for me, too many engineers have been forced to become eunuchs and prostitutes when it comes to speaking up about government policy. They can't do it. In the Sunday, January 9th, 1994 issue of the Washington Post, there was an essay by Carl Sagan, and it was titled, if you haven't read it, it's a very interesting essay, it's called, With Science on Our Side. And uh, I'll extract a little bit from it. He says, we have uh, arranged a civilization in which transportation, communications, and all in the industries, and I would add electric power, he didn't, profoundly depend on science and technology. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. We might get away with this for a while, but eventually this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. I think he's laid down a challenge for all of us. I, I hope that some of you in the audience will be able to do something about this. And with this, I'd like to thank the panel very, very much for their contributions. And uh, forgive me for my sermon, but I just couldn't resist. It's the last chance for me. And thank you very much for your attendance and your help. Jack, will you save the questions?